So we, uh, we started looking at Christmas uh, in early December, first week of December, and we have, over the past few weeks, looked at uh, the two prophecies of Malachi. There, there are many in Scripture, but we just narrowed it down to two that, that kind of summed it all up, that uh, a Messiah is coming, a Savior is coming, and that uh, there will be a forerunner to that uh, Messiah who would bring repentance, and we looked at that. But the next week, we looked at uh, Zechariah at the, the temple uh, being visited by Gabriel, and says, you're going to have a son. It'll be the forerunner. It was John the Baptist who was born. Uh, we looked at Mary uh, a few months later, who uh, the angel Gabriel shows up and, and says, uh, you're going to have a baby. There's going to be a supernatural uh, event, uh, and you will have the Son of God. You'll be the Savior. And then we looked at the birth of Jesus last week. And really up to this point, there hasn't been a lot of fanfare. I mean, there's been personal conversations uh, of an angel with an individual, um, there has been a birth, which is, I mean, obviously just birth in itself is a miraculous event, but the, the Son of God, but even that was kind of a personal family thing. Uh, the, you know, the whole world didn't know what was going on. They might have shared with a few people what, what was happening, but, you know, who really believed it? Who knows? Uh, so it wasn't a big eventful thing up to this point as far as fanfare and, and excitement and, and, and everything. Uh, it's just a couple of very tired uh, new parents uh, managing a fresh childbirth and a newborn child. And, and, and so Mary tells us he's going to be the Savior. Uh, Zechariah tells us he's going to be the Savior. But, I mean, how do we know, right? How, do we really put all of our faith and rest it on the shoulders of a young teenage uh, pregnant girl? Or is there possibly more? Uh, we know Jesus was the Savior that the Old Testament prophets spoke about. For one thing, if you study the prophecies and, and, and apologetics in Scripture, you, I mean, we can come up to some great conclusions that Jesus is exactly uh, who he said he was later on. But, but still, in the, in the beginning point here, how do, how do we know just from what we've seen so far that this is really uh, the, 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 the Savior? What we're going to look at today is some independent uh, people who are going to confirm the story of Mary and the story of Zechariah and, and the prophecies of, of, of the Old Testament, who had no reason to step forward and say these things. Like they didn't have, they, they had no reason to protect Mary. They, had, they didn't even know who they were. They didn't know, I mean, they, they, they were complete outsiders and strangers who now step into the story confirming that definitely God is up to something big. So that's what we're going to look at today, some confirmation of the Messiah being born. We'll start with the confirmation from the shepherds in Luke chapter 2, verse 8. There are shepherds living out in the fields nearby. So was, Jesus has been born, right? We took that last week. And now the shepherds out there doing their thing. They're living out in the fields. That's what they do. They're watching, uh, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone all around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Now this is significant news. This is, this is headline type of stuff, right? right? That The shepherds are strangers to Joseph and Mary. They're out working in the fields. An angel appears to them. The glory of the Lord shines around them, shown around them, uh, and it's a significant event, whatever that looked like, whatever that felt like, it was a significant event that these shepherds are terrified. I mean, they're, they're, they, it, it rocks, it shakes their, their world. Uh, and it's not like they're imagining this happening. It's not like one of them had something funky in his coffee that, that made him like see hallucinations. I mean, I mean it, it's, they all see this. They all verify this is what, what is happening. So they're all witnessing this at the same time. The shepherds are confronted by God, and they're terrified. I haven't gotten the uh, shepherd's attention now. The angel tells them to head to Bethlehem to check out a special baby that has been born. And, and the angel uses a couple very important words to describe this baby. 
that, that, that gives them motivation, like, no, you really, it's not like, hey, go check out the hospital nursery. It's like, no, you really need to see this baby. He calls them, uh, him a savior. Your savior has been born. Someone who's gonna save you from something. Right? If you run out in front of a car and I see the car coming and I grab you and pull you back to the curb, I have just saved you from something awful and terrible happening. This, this baby is gonna save people from something awful that is going to happen to them. It's going to happen. It's on the way. And, and, and a Savior has been born to, to pull them out. Now, in case you've forgotten what that is, Malachi said it very uh, clearly. And I just want to read that verse again, Malachi chapter 4, verse 1, the, the terrible thing that's on the way. Uh, Behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven, when all the arrogant and all evildoers, that's, that's us, will be stubble. The day that is coming shall set them ablaze, says the Lord of hosts, so that they will leave it, so that it will leave them neither root nor branch. We're going to be totally annihilated. Awful things are going to happen. Sounds like a thousand times or more worse than getting hit, being hit by a car. Fortunately, Malachi tells the people that God's going to send someone to save us from that, and the angel tells the shepherd, guess what? Here he is. The, the Savior has been born, the one who is going to save people. He's in Bethlehem. Go check him out. He's lying in a manger. Okay? Very, a second word, a very important word that uh, the angel used is he is Christ. Uh, Greek word Christos. It means Messiah. It's the anointed one. It is the one. Right? Not just a baby. Not, oh, it's the cutest baby you've ever seen. Uh, it, it's like, no, the one has been born. Christ is not his last name, it's his title. He is Messiah. The baby is the anointed one. He is the one God said all along throughout the Old Testament that he would send to regain uh, the throne of David to build a new kingdom. So, so there the angels are processing. At this point, it's an angel talking to them, and the shepherds are processing this information that the angel ha ha has said to them. They're like, whoa, wait, what? What Savior? Uh, the Messiah? Uh, like, whoa, glory of the Lord? Like, I mean, they're, they're like in shock, and they're figuring out, processing this whole moment, and it while that is happening, verse 13 uh, it goes into overdrive, and verse 13 says, suddenly a great company of the heavenly hosts appeared with the angel. Now we're talking fanfare. <laughs> okay. uh, praising God, saying glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. When the angels left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, one another uh, yeah, let's go to Bethlehem to see this thing that's happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told about them, uh, about, about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. So the shepherds are told where to find Mary and Joseph, where to find Jesus. They see him in person. And, and remember, at this point, uh, to, even to Mary and Joseph, uh, it was, an, I mean, a they had a baby, right? I mean, there's no fanfare, there's no excitement. I mean, it's excitement, but it's, but, it's, but it's not like at the level we're talking angels singing, you know. And the shepherds, strangers, complete strangers, come to them and say, you should have heard, you know who this child is? And Mary's like, yeah, I talked to that guy too a few months ago, uh, assuming it was Gabriel, but it didn't, doesn't, this time doesn't say it's Gabriel, but, but they're like, yeah, yeah, I talked to an angel. I know, I know, I know who this is. Uh, so Mary remembers having a very similar experience. It's been nine months, so it could be a little fuzzy by that point, but, but, but the, big, the big picture of it is definitely fresh in, in her mind. And they're like, it's a confirmation. This child is exactly who the angel said it would be. God told you, God told Elizabeth, God told shepherds, strangers out in the fields doing their work at night. And then the shepherds actually kind of won up the story a little bit. We didn't just see Gabriel. We saw an entire company of the heavenly host praising God for the birth of the Savior. This was a spiritual, monumental event celebrating the arrival of the Messiah. Now, I don't know what that looked like. 
I mean, I've tried to imagine it. I don't know what that sounded like. We always think of it in the terms of, of music and musicals because like usually we, you know, there's music involved with that in, in, that we hear. But it doesn't. It just says they said it. So could they, they could, maybe they sung it. Maybe they said it. We know in heaven both things happen. I mean, who, who knows? But it was a monumental event celebrating the salvation uh, of, of man. Now, now, I'm not in a big hurry to die, but, but I think one of these days I get to join that heavenly host. And that's going to be cool. I mean, don't, don't be too sorry for me. You know, like, oh, Dan got hit by the ice cream truck. I said, it's like, like no, 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 no. Uh, I'll be in, in this heavenly host joining them in the celebration of the salvation of mankind, especially as one who's been saved. I'll be rejoicing all the more. <laughs> uh, it's going to be a good day. It's going to be a good day. I, I have a feeling there was probably a little something, something extra in the step of the shepherds when they went back to the fields because it says they went back to the field praising God. And like, yeah. You don't, you don't have an experience like that without having a little extra step, a little bump in, in your step. Um, and they're, they're just thinking about the night and everything they experience, it, and, it, and it's just, just pretty, pretty, pretty cool time. I, I, they went around telling people. I, I, I can only imagine that some 30 years later, you know those stories, you hear a story like, hey, the Savior's been born. Like, okay, well, that, well, that sounds like a crazy story. And then nothing happens like for weeks and months and years. And about 30 years later, this guy shows up and starts doing all these things. I wonder if some of those stories from the shepherds started popping back in people's minds like, hey, you know, I remember th- this guy telling us about the angels and heavenly hosts and the saying of the Savior. You know, I, I, I think it was one of those dots that God used to connect uh, for a lot of people in confirming that Jesus was the Messiah. This uh, eyewitness account is, is a confirmation that everything Mary and Joseph said was, was accurate. It was true. That everything that uh, uh, Zechariah and Elizabeth had said was, was true over the past 15 months or so um, with uh, the process leading up to the birth of Jesus. All right? That's pretty impressive, but there's more. We have confirmation at the temple. Jesus is born eight days later, as is the process. There's a sacrifice that, that is taking place, and, and they, they name the child the circumcision since he's a boy, and, 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 and they go through this process. So they go to the temple, as, as the law states, and as they, they would do. And while they're there, a complete stranger named Simeon comes up. He walks up to them. And now, Luke, who wrote the Gospel of Luke, is a doctor. He's, he's a, a student, he studies, he looks for details, he, he interviewed people, he, he gathered a lot of information before he, he wrote uh, the book of Luke. So Luke tells us from his investigation that Simeon was a godly man. He probably talked to several people to get that information, that he was patiently waiting for the Messiah. No doubt he, he interviewed, um, well, maybe we don't know if Simeon was alive when Luke, anyway, but the in, in, uh, investigation tells us that Simeon was a godly man and that God <clears throat> had promised Simeon that he would see the Messiah before he died. Now, I, we don't know how that, like, was it a vision? Was it an angel? I mean, we, we, don't, we don't know, but somehow Simeon knew he was going to see the Messiah before uh, he died. He didn't know necessarily what the Messiah would look like. Uh, he, I mean, he didn't, wasn't looking for, like I said, a name tag or anything like that. Uh, he didn't know when he would come or where it would pro- happen. All he knew was the wait, and so he waited and he waited enough, enough that it kind of sounds like it was starting to wear on him. Like, really? Am I still? Have you ever waited on God? And, and your timetable is quick. And, he, and he's like, don't worry. I got this. Well, he'd waited uh, long enough that, that one day, out of the blue, there he is at the temple. There's Mary. There's Joseph. And they're naming their little baby Jesus and, and a name that God saves. And he goes over to the family, Simeon does, and he prays out loud in Luke chapter 2, verse 29. Lord, now you're letting your servant depart in peace. It's like, finally, right? according to your word, my eyes have seen your salvation that you have prepared in the presence of all peoples. A light to the revelations, <clears throat> excuse me, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people. Israel. Uh, uh, Simeon actually adds a little, little hint of a new information here. We know he's going to be the Savior. We know he's the Messiah. That's kind of a Jewish thing, uh, a Hebrew thing. Uh, but Simeon adds he's going to be a light for revelation to the Gentiles, us. It's going to go beyond just the Jewish nation. He's a Savior of the world. It's been said, but I don't know if people kind of filter it through their own experience. Oh, yeah, for the Jewish nation. It's like, no, it's for everybody. It's for everybody. All of a sudden, this is about the whole world. Now again, 
Um, that happens, and there's another person at the temple a woman. And again, Luke does his uh, investigative research, and he discovers about this woman that she is a, a prophetess, uh, so she's in a good connection with God. Not like the Old Testament prophets, be- because there was a silence of 400 years, we know that. So, but, but there was, so she was in a, still a very good relationship with God. She was a godly woman. Uh, she became a widow after she'd been married only seven years, so she, she was probably uh, in her 20s when her husband died. And since her husband's death, Uh, Luke discovered she'd been at the temple pretty much every day praying and fasting regularly. Uh, Just just that she dedicated her life to God. Luke also tells us she's 84 years old. So we're talking decades, maybe 60 years. Uh, Some play with the, the Greek. It could be the 84 is how long she was at the temple. Either way, it's decades. She was at the temple fasting, worshiping, praying, and when she sees baby Jesus, she lit up. She lit up and began telling people the Messiah had arrived. Verse 38 of Luke 2, she began to give thanks to God and speak of him to all who were waiting for the redemption of Jerusalem. There were others waiting, so many people waiting for the Messiah, and she's like, I've seen him. I've seen him. God revealed to her. Again, an independent person, an eyewitness, God had a story for her. Uh, Two complete strangers confirmed what the angel Gabriel had told Mary and Zechariah, confirmed what Joseph had been told in a dream when he was deciding, do I stay with Mary because she's pregnant? This isn't going to end well. Uh, They confirmed what John the Baptist, how he responded uh, in in utero when when, when, uh, Mary met Elizabeth, you know, when they were both still pregnant and, and there was a reaction. These two people confirmed what they uh, experience. These two people confirm what the shepherds said they had seen and experienced. Uh, and like I said, Simeon and Anna are not the only ones in the temple waiting. There's others in who, who come regularly to prayer and, and to, to worship and, and to seek God who are waiting. And they know who they are and they run and tell every one of them the Messiah had been born. The Messiah had been born. It's a pretty good confer- uh, confirmation when a group of strangers, uh, like the shepherds, uh, or a couple unrelated strangers in the temple on day eight, but there's there's more. There's there's more confirmation in the story. There's the wise men who come from 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 far away, who who have quite a traveling distance, uh, who have nothing, no real connection to the faith of of the Hebrews, other than Daniel, you know, they had been captured in Babylon uh, you know, hundreds of years earlier, and, and they were assuming these are from that area who came who probably read the, the writings of Daniel. Uh, and it's in chapter 2 of Matthew, so we're going to escape Luke for a little bit and look at Matthew. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea in the days of Herod uh, the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. So many, you know, it doesn't say that he came at the night, that they came at the night of Jesus' birth. It doesn't say they came on day eight when they were at at the temple. That's that's not necessarily when it happened. It says they saw his star when it rose, and then they made the journey to Jerusalem. Now Herod doesn't know anything about Jesus. He doesn't know there's another king that has been born. So he tells the wise men, hey, go find him, and then I'll I'll meet with him. I'd like to honor him too, Um, you you know, because I want to, you know, play that game. Of course, he just wants to get rid of Jesus. So the wise men find Jesus. They're warned in a dream not to go back to Herod. And verse 16 says that Herod, when he saw that he had been tricked, they they went on a different way, uh, but he'd been tricked by the wise men, came furious, became furious and sent and killed all the male children in Bethlehem and all in that region who were two years old or under according to the time that he had ascertained from the wise men. So, so, So two years have passed since they saw the star. And I don't know where that two years slides, you know, in, in, in the birth. Uh, a lot of people assume it was the star happened at the birth, and then two years later they came. Who knows? Maybe Jesus was proactive, and, and, or God was proactive and gave it. To, I mean, we, it doesn't, doesn't matter necessarily, but, but the timing is not that night, it, it, I guess, is, is the big thing. This confirmation comes at a different time, from a different land, from a different whole type, type of people. 
Um, and, and, but still confirma- confirmation none, nonetheless. Now, nobody knows what the star looked like. We talked a little bit about that on Christmas Eve. Uh, some suggest it was a comet. Some suggest uh, it's uh, the planets aligned that you've probably been reading about recently, that happened recently again. Uh, some suggest maybe it was an angel because it does move. It's not just something in the sky. It, it actually, they follow it. Um, so that suggests something in, in, in itself. Uh, we could have conversations all day long about that, and who knows who would be right, because you know, who, who, who knows? But we do know is it caught the eyes of trained stargazers. Right? I mean, they, they weren't uh, you know, new uh, at this. They, 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 this was a, a definitely part of, of their daily habits, or nightly habits. And, and it evidently didn't catch the attention of the general public. Uh, maybe they saw it. Maybe probably like me. If I see something like, whoa, look at that, and, but I wouldn't know what it meant. Uh, these people saw it and knew what it meant because they had the writings from, from the ancient days, like I said, probably from, from Daniel. Uh, but if everybody knew it, they all would have been following the star. You, you know, and, and that's not, not the case. It's, it's just these, these wise men. So it's another confirmation. Shepherds watching the flocks at night, <clears throat> two worshipers uh, in, in the temple who are there to pray and to worship, uh, spiritualists from a foreign land who watch the stars for signs. All of these were strangers to Mary and Joseph. None of them had anything to gain by confirming her story. None of them even knew she had a story. They just, God said, hey, go check out that baby. And they said, hey, God told us to check. Did you know who you have here? Do you, do you know who's in front of you? And, and she could say, well, yes, yes, I do. I do know. And, and all of these little, little stories intersected to, to combine into one big story that we call the Christmas story that we've talked about this month. The Christmas story, and there's so much more to it. I mean, we could have spent uh, weeks ahead of time looking at prophecies, you know, specifically. Um, and, and there's so much to this. But this, the Christmas story is, is a story of pursuit. That, that's the important thing for us to know, that, that it is God pursuing man over a number of generations. Uh, really, since the Garden of Eden, uh, he put a plan in place in pursuing us, knowing that, that we would need a Savior knowing that, that something really, really bad is going to happen when we fall and fail in sin, which includes all of us who have fallen and failed in sin. All of us have. We know that. So God pursued man to, to, to save them. I've never had a vision. <clears throat> I've never had an angel come to me and, and, and introduce me to God or, or to tell me where Jesus was, but he has been in the background of my life pursuing me since my birth. Knowing I would be born, uh, putting people and places in my life, the same with you, so that you would be saved. Uh, As a child, I had a mom who did her best to point me to Jesus. She wasn't a theologian by any means, but she knew Jesus, and she always said little, little thoughts to send me in that direction. Uh, you've heard stories of my Sunday school teacher in grade school who kept uh, pointing me to Jesus and kept loving me. I was a very unlovable child, uh, and she kept loving me. <laughs> I really was. <laughs> and and uh, she loved me and loved me, and it, enough that it, it, it melted my heart, and, 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 and uh, she, she showed me Jesus. I, I had a pastor that as a child I didn't interact with much because I was a kid and he was an adult, you know, um, but he was our neighbor, and he was also the pastor at the church, and, and I watched him, and, and he, he, he just, his life impressed me. Um, his, he, you know, obviously he wasn't a perfect human being, but I don't know about that. I just know that his life impressed me, and I thought, I want to I be, be like that guy. Um, and and uh, I followed a much of, of his example um, in, in the way he followed Christ. Um, all of that helped point me to Jesus. Now, you've had a, a similar stories, maybe family members, uh, maybe, maybe people where you work or friends or uh, could be internet these days, a uh, YouTube channel or, or something. Someone, uh, the truth is God's probably not going to give you a vision. If you're like on the fence wondering, what do I do with Jesus? Uh, he's probably not going to send you a personal angel. That doesn't happen very often. I mean, we've read a few of the times it's happened in the history of the world. Uh, it doesn't happen every day to people. Well, he could. I'm not going to say he's not, but, but I wouldn't be waiting for that. I wouldn't be waiting for a marvelous sign in the sky, you know, to, to tell you it's time. <laughs> Go find Jesus. We'll tell you where he's at. 
God's given you everything you need. It's in his written word. We've been talking about that for, well, for years, but uh, the last few weeks, his whole story is, is, is right there, everything we need to know. He's put those specific people in your life to point you to him. Uh, he's put circumstances and situations in your life uh, to point you to, to Jesus. And, and whoever it's been, God has placed people in your life to draw you even here today to hear the story again. He's pursuing you. He desires relationship with you. He desires to save you. Sometimes people think, oh, he's mean God. Is he going to really? Like, he doesn't want anyone to receive punishment that Malachi talks about. He desires to save you. All of these people we looked at today put at least part of their life on pause as, as God spoke to them to go find Jesus. Shepherd left their sheep. I mean, that's not a small thing. They left their sheep to go find Jesus. The worshipers of the temple uh, stopped whatever they were doing, whatever prayer they were in the middle of, wherever they were headed, whatever, you know, whatever, you know, you always have a list of things, I'm going to do this, this, and this. They stopped when they saw Jesus and paused and confirmed who he was. The wise men, this is the biggest pause, they paused whatever was going on in their life and they planned a journey and they went on uh, a, a very long journey to find Jesus. They didn't stop until they found him. Now, I don't know where you are for your relationship to Jesus. I, I have, uh, I, I'm, I'm a, you know there's a glass half full, glass half empty people. I always just see it full and actually that, that works against me sometimes. I just assume everything's great. <laughs> um, and, and I shouldn't, I shouldn't. I don't know where you are with Jesus. I don't know where you are in your relationship. Uh, don't, don't let my assumption that everything's great stop you from pursuing him. He, he, he has pursued you, and it's time for you to pursue him back. He put all the right things in the right place for you to hear this, even just this very moment. And if you want to know what to do next, please, please talk to me. I can show you. I can teach you. We can, that's what discipleship is. We'll just, we'll just make a long-term relationship of what do you do next? How do, what do you learn next? What do you need to know next in Scripture? Because uh, that, that's, that's what we're all about is making disciples of Jesus Christ. And it starts with that, it's a, that desire of pursuit. I want to I study him. I want to learn him. I want to follow him. I, I believe him. I, I, I mean, there's, there's too many things pointing to his reality as a Savior. Let him save you. Let him.